Today we start with chapter 21, our first chapter on the third part of the course, which is about electricity. And the title of the chapter is Coulomb's Law, which as you will see, is the core of chapter 21. What we will do today, apart from Coulomb's Law, we will start by reviewing some basic ideas from electricity that you already know from your high school. Uh, and we will uh, review them here, and then we will uh, focus more on Coulomb's law. What we will talk about are electric charge and electric force, fundamental particles, conductors and insulators, induction and grounding, and finally charge quantization and conservation. I think we will not talk about this here, but it is already discussed in the uh, lecture, which is posted on YouTube. So let's first talk about electric charge. In electricity, charge, which we represent by Q, it's unfortunately the same symbol we used for uh, heat, uh, charge plays the same role as mass in mechanics. So how important was mass in mechanics? This is how important is charge in electricity. Imagine that you want to do mechanics problems without talking about the mass. You can never do anything in mechanics without the mass. The same thing, you can never do anything in electricity without the charge. It is the fundamental quantity in electricity. The biggest difference between mechanics and electricity is that mass is always positive, but the charge can be positive or negative. If an object contains equal amounts of positive and negative charges, the object is electrically neutral, and we say that it has no net charge. We don't say it doesn't have charge. It has a charge. It has positive and negative charge, but they are equal, so the net charge is equal to zero. And therefore, an object is said to be charged if it has a net charge. The SI unit for electric charge is the Coulomb, and we will give it the, the symbol capital C. A charged objects interact by exerting forces on each other. The force between stationary fixed charges is called the electrostatic force, and this is what we will be considering from now, maybe until the end of chapter 25, electrostatic forces. The charges with the same electrical sign, like in here, both negative, repel each other, and the charges with opposite, like here, positive and negative, with opposite electrical signs attract each other. Here is a, another big difference between electricity and magnetism. Uh, sorry, electricity and mechanism. Electricity and mechanics. In mechanics, the gravitational forces are always attractive, but in electricity, the electrostatic forces can be attractive or repulsive. And here are the uh, electrical properties of the fundamental particles that make up matter. You know that matter is made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. Electrons carry negative charge. We say that the, the charge of an electron is minus E. It's negative. And the value of the charge, we give it the symbol E, which is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Protons have the same charge as electrons. We are talking about the value, the magnitude of the charge of the proton is the same as the magnitude of the charge of the electron, but it is positive. Neutrons carry no charge, that's why we call them neutrons. Neut comes from neutral, they are particles with zero charge. So these are the three fundamental particles. Protons and neutrons are packed tightly inside the nucleus. Inside the nucleus you have protons and, nucle uh, nucle and neutrons, the protons are positive, the uh, neutrons are, um, are neutral. So here is a big question. How can you put so many protons inside the nucleus, and they are all positive, they will start repelling each other, and still you have the nucleus intact. The nucleus doesn't disintegrate. How could that happen? This is a question for you to think about. The electrons, as we can see in here, are attracted to the nucleus. Here is the nucleus. It is positively charged. Around the nucleus, we have the electrons, which are negatively charged. The atom, which is the whole thing, the atom consists of the nucleus surrounded by the 
negative electrons. There is an equal number of protons and, and electrons in the atom, and therefore the atom is electrically neutral. If you can take one or more electrons from an atom, or if you can add one or more electrons to the atom, the atom becomes an ion. Okay, an ion is a charged atom. With that, let's now talk about the electrical properties of materials. Materials can be divided from an electrical point of view into conductors and insulators, and indeed, in between these two classes, we nowadays have a third class, which are called semiconductors. But let's focus here on uh, conductors and insulators. Conductors are materials, like metals, in which charge, basically electrons, can move freely. So what makes them conductors is that in their electronic structure, they have free electrons, and these electrons, because they are free, they can move around and therefore conduct the electric current. In a conductor, some of the outermost electrons, if you write the electronic structure of that element, like sodium, for example, 1 is 2, 2 is 2, 2p6, 3 is 1. Okay, so here is the single 3 electron. That makes sodium uh, a conductor. So in a conductor, some of the outermost in the uh, outermost shell are free to move throughout the material, and these are called conduction electrons. Insulators, which are also called non-conductors, are materials in which charges cannot move freely. The electrons are rigidly attached to the atoms. They are not free to move, and therefore they, these materials cannot conduct electric current. Next, we will talk about charge quantization and conservation. Let's start with quantization. The smallest possible charge is the charge of the electron, which is equal to 1.6 into the minus 19 Coulomb. This is the charge of the electron, and that is the smallest charge you can have in nature. Here is another big difference between electricity and mechanics. In mechanics, the mass is continuous. You can have any value of the mass, as small as 9.11 into the minus 31, which is the uh, mass of the electron, and anything above that is possible. But in electricity, the charge is quantized. What do we mean by, by quantization? We mean that any charge that you can find in nature is equal to an integer number of the charge of the electron. An integer number of the charge of the electron. So it goes like 1e, 2e, 3e, and so on. You cannot have something like 4.7e. That is not possible. And therefore, the charge has discrete values. It's like a ladder. It has discrete values, and anything, any quantity that goes in a discrete manner, in a digitized manner, is called a quantized quantity. So that's what we mean by quantization. Every charge is an integral multiple of the charge of the electron. The charge of the electron is the smallest block, the building block of a charge in nature. Electric charge is always conserved. By that we mean the charge cannot be created, but rather it can be transferred between objects. So these are the uh, basic quick quantities we have with regard to electricity. Let's now talk in detail about Coulomb's law, which is really the core of chapter 21. Coulomb's law is the most fundamental law in electricity. Its importance in electricity is the same as the importance of Newton's laws in mechanics. Remember in mechanics, F is equal to MA. Everything in mechanics is built on that, on Newton's second law. The same story with electricity, but instead of Newton's second law, now we have Coulomb's law. It is the basic law in electricity and everything else is built on it. It enables us, this is what it does, it enables us to calculate the electric force between charged objects. So let's consider two charged particles could have the same sign, both positive or opposite signs. Coulomb's law says that the electrostatic force F between these two particles is given by Q 
q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. Okay, now let's look at this equation. It is very similar to an equation we have studied in physics 101, which is Newton's law of gravitation. Remember that f is equal to g m1 m2 divided by r squared. The gravitational force depends on the masses of the particles and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the particles. Here we have the same story. It depends on the charges of the particles, inversely proportional to the uh, square of the distance between the particles. So mathematically, it has the same form as Newton's law of gravitation. The only difference is the proportionality constant. In the case of gravitational forces, it was the gravitational constant, 6.67 into the minus 11. And here it is equal to this quantity, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So g is replaced by that. 4 is known, pi is known. Epsilon 0 is the fundamental constant of uh, electricity, like g in mechanics. Here we have something called epsilon 0, which is called the permittivity of free space. Don't worry about this terminology. It is called permittivity of free space, and its value is uh, 8.85, times 10 to the minus 12. Now, if you take 4 pi, multiply it by this, and then take the reciprocal, you will get a very simple number, very simple to memorize. It will be 9 times 10 to the power 9, and that we will call from now on k, okay, which is what we have here. So, this form is very similar to Newton's law of gravitation. Instead of g, now we have k. Instead of the masses, we have uh, the charges and the distance is there. The difference, again, between mechanics and electricity is that in mechanics, the gravitational force is always an attractive force, but in electricity, the force can be attractive or repulsive. Let's look at the direction of the force. Here is the magnitude. How do we determine the direction of the force? Well, first of all, the force is along the line that joins the two particles, okay? It's along this line that joins the two particles. If the signs of the charges are opposite, like positive and negative, the force is attractive, as you can see in here. This force is trying to pull this one toward the other one. On this one, it will try to pull it that way. If the signs are the same, the force will be repulsive. It will try to repel the two particles away from each other. So again, it is along the line, but it is a repulsive force. It will try to push the particle away from the other one, but the magnitude of the force in either case will be given by uh, that quantity. If we have more than two particles, then we apply the superposition principle, which says that the net electrostatic force on any particle is equal to the vector sum of the individual forces acting on this particle due to all other uh, particles. So uh, now you can see that we are coming back to vectors, something that is not pleasant to you, I know, but electricity is heavily based on vector quantities. So you really have to put yourself in the correct mood when you start your study of uh, electricity. A common type of problems that is usually asked with uh, the application of Coulomb's law, I call it, I call it equilibrium problems. What do we mean by equilibrium problems? It means that you have two particles that are fixed in space, and you want to bring a third particle, place it somewhere, so that the net force on the third particle is zero. That's what I mean by equilibrium. Uh, the, the, the analysis is, I went through the analysis in detail in the lecture, uh, I think this is lecture six, 17, I think so, lecture 17 uh, video on YouTube, and I went through the analysis in detail, I, I advise you to look at that, and the conclusion is, if the two charges, if the two charges, here are the two charges, and I want to bring a third charge, place it somewhere, so that the net force on the third one is zero. First of all, the third charge should be put on the, 
or along the line that connects the two particles. You cannot put it above or below. It should be on the line connecting the two particles, number one. Number two, if the two particles carry the same sign, both positive or both negative, then the point of equilibrium where the net force on the third one is zero should be between the two particles and it is closer to the weaker charge. So the magnitude of the charge is compensated by the distance. If the two charges carry, or if the two particles carry opposite charges like positive and negative, then the point of equilibrium will be outside them, again closer to the weaker charge. So this is a summary of what we mean by equilibrium uh, problems. And you will see that when we discuss or look at some exam problems. The last thing we have uh, with regard to uh, chapter 21 is the shield theorem. This is very similar to the shield theorem that we studied in chapter 13 of physics 101 when we discussed gravitational forces. The shield theorem says the electric force on a particle outside a uniformly charged spherical shell is like the electric force between the particle and another particle placed at the center of the shell. So let's break this down. Here we are talking about the electrostatic force between what and what? Between a particle and a spherical shell. It's empty inside, like a football. And it is spherical in shape, in shape and the charge is uniformly distributed over the surface of the shell. So here is the situation. We have a uniformly charged spherical shell, okay, like this one here, and here is the particle outside it. What will be the electrostatic force exerted by the shell on the particle? The shell theorem says, if this is the situation, you can simply replace the shell with a particle at the center of the shell, and then apply Coulomb's law to find the electrostatic force between these two particles. Very simple situation. If the particle is inside the shell, if the particle is inside the shell, then it force on it due to the shell is equal to zero, exactly like we have studied in physics 101. So this is a quick overview of the main ideas that we have in chapter 21. Again, you need to look at the video of chapter or lecture 17 uh, to go through these ideas in more detail. As usual, we will now start looking at exam problems uh, related to chapter 21. And again, I remind you that these are problems that appeared in the uh, exams of the last three years. So let's start. We start here uh, with problem six or question six in the final exam of term 171 that says two identical, okay, identical 0.2 kilogram masses, both positive and both have the same mass, are placed one meter apart. This is the center to center distance of the particles on a frictionless surface. Each has plus 10 microcoulomb of charge. The charge of each one is plus 10 microcoulomb. What is the initial acceleration of one of the masses if it is released from rest and allowed to move? So here is the situation. We have these two charged objects, okay? Let's say that the distance between them is much greater than the size of each one of them. They carry charges, so there will be repulsive force between them. They are both positive. And let's say that you fix this one and you release this one. You allow it to move on a frictionless surface. The repulsive force will try to push it away. Okay, so there will be a force exerted on it. The force is associated with acceleration. So the question says, what will be the initial acceleration? The moment you release this one, what will be the initial acceleration of one of the masses if it is released uh, from rest and allowed to move? So. Here we apply Newton's second law, F is equal to MA, except now F is given by Coulomb's law. So uh, the answer will be as follows. This is the final of term 
171. The force exerted on that one, let's say that the right one is the one that is released, according to Newton's second law is equal to m times a. So the acceleration, which is what he is looking for, is equal to f over m, and f is given by Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law says the electrostatic force between the two uh, particles is equal to k q squared. They carry the same charge. Each one of them has that much charge, so q1, q2 is just q squared over m from here and r squared from Coulomb's law. This is the acceleration. All what you have to do now is substitute the values. The electrostatic constant, 9, 10 to the power 9, and the charge is 10 times 10 to the minus 6 micro, that's 10 to the minus 5. And then you square it, that will be 10 to the minus 10, divided by the mass of each one is 0.2, which is 2 times 10 to the minus 1, and the distance is 1 meter squared, that is 1. So 9 over 2 is 4.5, and then this will give me minus 1 over minus 1, that will disappear. So we just have 4.5 meters per second squared. This is, of course, the initial acceleration. At the instant, you release that one. Is that constant acceleration? Definitely not, because the force depends on the distance. So as the distance increases, the force will decrease and the acceleration will decrease. It will not remain at this value. That's why he is asking about the initial acceleration at the moment of release. Next, we look at question one of the second major of term 183 which says two identical small conducting spheres separated by a center to center distance of 20 centimeters have equal electric charge. We have two small spheres and they have the same electric charge. The distance between the spheres centers, which is the 20 centimeters, is very large compared to the spheres radii. So you can consider the spheres to be particles. How many excess extra electrons must be present on each sphere if the magnitude of the force of repulsion between them is 3.33 times 10 to the minus 21 newtons. So this is really a composite problem because we have Coulomb's law and then we have the charge conservation. We are given the force between the two spheres, so let's start with that. According to Coulomb's law, The force between the two spheres is equal to k q squared divided by r squared. They carry the same, okay? They have the same electric charge, so that's q squared. Okay, so from here, you can find the charge on each one of them. Uh, just take it from here. It will be f r squared, f r squared divided by k under the square root. This is the charge on each one of them. How much is that? We are told that the force between them is 3.33 times 10 to the minus 21. And the distance between them is 20 centimeters. That's 0.2. And then you square it. That would be 0.04 divided by k, which is 9 times 10 to the power 9 under the square root. So from here you can calculate the charge on each one of them and if you do so you will find that this is equal to 1.22 times 10 to the minus 16 Coulomb. Okay that's the charge on each one of them. <clears throat> now let's bring in the charge quantization. A charge quantization says any charge like this one is an integer n multiplied by the charge of the electron. So we write that mathematically as any charge q is equal to <coughs> an integral multiple n 
of the charge of the electron. That's charge quantization. So how many electrons will make up this charge that we got here? That's what he is looking for. So you take the charge that you got, Q, divided by the charge of the electron, which in this case will be 1.22 times 10 to the minus 16, divided by the charge of the electron, which is 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19. And if you divide these two, you will get 760 electrons as the number of electrons that combine together to give us this much charge that we got in here. Okay. The next problem is this one, question six in the final of 181. Let's see what it says. It says a particle with a charge of 5, 10 to the minus 6, okay, we have the charge of the particle, and its mass moves with a constant speed, it moves with constant speed of 7 meters per second in a circular orbit. Okay, we have a particle moving around the circle with constant speed. What did we call that type of motion in physics 101? We called it uniform circular motion. Here is an example of that. So it is moving in a circular orbit around a stationary particle. It's like hydrogen, for example, the hydrogen atom. The nucleus, you have a proton, and around it you have the electron, okay, going in a circle. So that's an example of what we are talking about here. This particle is going around a stationary particle whose charge is minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. It's, it has to be attractive force. This is positive. This is negative, so they attract each other, and this force of attraction is, in this case, the, the centripetal force that causes uniform circular motion. It's like the motion of a satellite around the Earth, okay? They have the same magnitude of charge, but opposite charges, so attractive force. What is the radius of the orbit? So here, we have to bring up the ideas of uniform circular motion that we studied in Physics 101 and couple it to what we have here. So, from our study of Physics 101, this is final of 181. We know that the centripetal force on the particle is equal to mv squared over r. This is the force that makes it go with constant speed in a circular orbit. The only new thing is that we know what is the force now. It's Coulomb's force. It's the attractive electrostatic force between the two. So Coulomb's force, F, which is the centripetal force now, is equal to KQ squared. Again, they carry the same charge, 15 to the minus 6, 15 to the minus 6, except that one is positive, one is negative. We don't worry about the size if we are calculating the magnitude divided by the distance between them, which is the radius of the circle, so that is r squared. Now let us uh, take this one and substitute it in here. What do we get? We get kq squared over r squared is equal to mv squared divided by r. Okay, so from here we can cancel this r with this one, and what we get is, I will leave this one here, take this pair, 1 over r is equal to mv squared divided by kq squared. So the radius of the orbit is equal to kq squared divided by mv squared. And now let's see, do we have k? Yes, that's 9 10 to the power 9. q is equal to 5, 10 to the minus 6, we have it. The mass of the rotating particle, 2, 10 to the minus 2 kilograms, and its speed is 7 meters per second. You put everything in here, substitute the numbers, and you will get the answer as 0.23 meters as the radius of this circular orbit.
This is a kind of uh, superposition principle, it looks like. Let's see. The problem says particle one. Where is that? Particle one with the charge Q1 and particle 2 with the charge Q2 are on the x-axis with particle 1 at x equal to 4 centimeters and particle 2 at x equal to minus 2 centimeters if Q1 is equal to 4 Q2 if the magnitude of this is 4 times the magnitude of this one calculate the magnitude of the net electric force on a third particle of charge Q3 located at the origin. Now, you can uh, do the analysis directly, okay? But I think this is a kind of problem where you don't have to waste any time. The answer must be zero. If it is anything else, I have to know what are the values of the Qs. Since I'm not given, the values of the Qs, it means that the Qs will cancel each other and the answer must be zero. Okay. The way to do this, if you want to do it in more detail, is to think about it in terms of the electric field, as we will see in the next chapter. But I will leave that at this point. I would like to answer it conceptually and the answer must be zero. Otherwise, if it is anything else, I have to know what are the magnitudes of uh, these charges to be able to proceed and calculate the force. Where again we have, it's like this one, two charged particles find the force on a third one. Here we have the same thing, two charged particles find the force on a third one, but now we are given the magnitudes of the charges, so we can proceed. The problem says a particle with a charge plus 40 microcoulomb is located on the x-axis at x equal to minus 20 centimeters. And the second particle of charge minus 50 microcoulomb is placed on the x-axis at x equal to plus 30 centimeters. What is the magnitude of the total the net electrostatic force on a third particle of charge minus 4 placed at the origin? So this is a superposition principle problem. You find the force due to each one and then uh, find the net force. The first step you should do with such problems is to determine the directions of the forces. First of all, ask yourself, which particle am I going to study? We want to find the force on the particle at the origin. So I should draw the forces acting with this one. I don't care about the other two. This is the one that I want to analyze. So let me draw it in here. Okay. First of all, let, let me number them. Let me call this one 1, let me call this one 2, and let me call this one 3. So I want to find the forces acting on number 3. Okay, let's look at what is happening between these two. Opposite charges, so the force will be an attractive force. And that will be the force on particle number 3 due to particle number 1. Next, there will be a force between this and that. They are both negative, so this will be a repulsive force. This one will try to push this one away from it. It's a repulsive force. So again, the force will be pointing to the left. This is the force on 3 due to 2. And therefore, the two forces are in the same direction. We found the direction. Now we have to find how much is each one of them and then add them, okay, he is only interested in the magnitude, so just add them and find the net force. Let's do that. This is question six in the final exam, in the final exam of term 172. So, F31, the force between 3 and 1, here are the, 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 uh, the charges so we have it's k q3 q1 over r3 1 squared the distance between 3 and 1 let's put the numbers 9 10 to the power 9 q3 where is 3 3 is the one at the origin 4 micro 4 10 to the minus 6 and q1 q1 is this one which is 40 micron 
40 10 to the minus 6 divided by the distance between them. The distance between them is, uh, where is that? The, no. Plus 40 is located at 20 centimeters. So 0 0.2, 0 0.2 means uh, 4 10 to the minus 4. 4 10 to the minus 4, isn't it? No, that will be 400, 14 to the minus 2. Okay? So how much is this? We cancel the 4 with the 4. 9 times 4 is 36. Okay? And let's deal with the exponents now. This will go up as 11. 11 minus, uh, sorry, this is 9 times 40. So 360 times 10 to the uh, this would be 11 minus 12, that would be 10 to the minus 1, so that is 36 in newtons, 36 newtons. And then we find F32, F32 will be in the same way, 9 times 10 to the minus 9, F3 is the one at the origin, 4 10 to the minus 6, and then we have 2 is the far away 1, which is 50 micro, 50 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by the distance between them is 30 centimeters. Okay, so 30, 3 times 10 to the minus 1. Uh, and then you square it, that would be 9 times 10 to the minus 2. So the 9 will cancel the 9. 50 times 4 is 200. 200 times 10 to the 11 minus 12 is minus 1, so this is 20 newtons. And therefore, all what you have to do now is to add these two forces, 36 plus 20, that will be 56 newtons as the magnitude of the net force acting on the particle at the origin. So this is an example of the superposition principle. The next problem is a problem for or question for in the second major exam of term 172. Let's see what do we have there. It says two small identical insulating charged spheres, each of mass 0.2 kilograms. Uh, one is fixed on the floor and the other is hanging vertically above the first with a massless string with a center-to-center -center separation of 2 centimeters, as shown in the figure. A charge Q, the same charge, both positive, so there will be a repulsive electrostatic force. A charge Q is uniformly distributed on each sphere. If the tension in the string is 0.52, find the value of Q. So we are given the value of the tension. Uh, if we don't have this one, the tension will be equal to the weight of this one. But now we have an extra repulsive force, so the tension will change, and we are given what is the tension, so the question is what will be the, the value of Q. Now to answer this, we have to first draw the free body diagram of this situation, and I will draw the free body diagram of this sphere. Let's see what it has. Here is the sphere, this one. What are the forces acting on it? Well, we have the gravitational force mg we have the tension t and there is the repulsive electrostatic force between the two spheres it's repulsive so it will try to push this away from that one and therefore here we have an extra electrostatic force the system is in equilibrium so these forces are equal and therefore the situation will be as follows Equate the forces, T plus the electrostatic force is equal to M times G. So the electrostatic force is equal to Mg minus the tension. Let's find out how much is this. Well, M, the mass is equal to 0.2 kilograms, 0.2 times 9.8 minus the tension, which we are told is 0.52. So the 
electrostatic force from this is equal to 1.44 newtons. Now apply Newton's second law, uh, sorry, Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law says the electrostatic force is equal to KQ squared. They carry the same charge, Q, so Q1, Q2 will be Q squared, divided by R squared, the separation between the two. What we are looking for now is the magnitude of the charge on each one of them, which is equal to Fe R squared divided by K under the square root. Now put the numbers. This is 1.44. The separation is 2 centimeters. Square that, that will be 4 times 10 to the minus 4. Everything should be in SI units divided by K. 9 times 10 to the power 9 and then take the square root that will give you the answer that we have in here for the charge on each sphere. Next we have I think another example of the superposition principle because here we have three particles and it seems we need to find the force on one of them. Let's see. The problem says three point charges. Three point charges are arranged as shown in the figure. Find the magnitude of the electric force on the charge at the origin. And read the problem carefully. He is only looking for the magnitude. Okay, so let's focus on the magnitude. How do we do that? We, we are interested in the force on the charge located at the origin. So find the forces on this one due to these two. What will happen? Positive and positive will have repulsive force, so there will be a leftward force on this one due to that one. Positive and negative will be an attractive force, so this will be attracted to this one, and therefore we will have a downward force. Leftward and downward forces, they are perpendicular, the angle is 90 degrees. Find the magnitude of each and then find the resultant. The situation will be as follows. The force between the positive particles, I will call it F plus plus. Okay, question two in major two, term 181. F plus plus is equal to 9, 10 to the power 9, and then we have 5 nano and 6 nano. So 5 times 6 times 10 to the minus 18. Nano is 10 to the minus 9, and then we have two of them, so that is 10 to the minus 18, divided by the distance, which is 0.3, so this will be 9 times 10 to the minus 2. That will be equal to, the 9 will cancel, and then we have 5 times 6 is 30, and then 30 times what? 5 times 6 is 30, we have this will go up as 11, 11 minus 18 is minus 7, minus 7, so this is 3 times 10 to the minus 6 Newton. I hope I did the calculations correctly. And then we find the force between the plus and the minus, the plus and the minus, okay, that will be 9, 10 to the power 9. And the one at the origin is 5, the one below, the negative one, is 3. Watch, I didn't take any signs in here because we already figured out the directions. Times 10 to the minus 18 divided by the distance, which is 0.1 meters, so 0 0.01, or 10 to the minus 2. So that will be uh, what? That will be... Uh, the, the plus minus will be equal to 1.35 times 10 to the minus 5 newtons. So we have these two forces. They look like this. Here is the F plus plus and here is the F plus minus. We have two forces. Find the magnitude of the resultant. The easiest way, as we studied in Physics 101, is to apply the parallelogram method. 
and in that case the net force is just the sum of the squares f plus plus squared plus f plus minus squared under the square root here are the values put them in here take the square root and that will give you a value of 1.4 times 10 to the minus 5 as the magnitude of the net force acting on the charge at the origin <coughs> Next, let us look at this one. What does it say? It says four pointed charges. Four pointed charges. QA, QB, QC, and QD are at the corners A, B, C, D of a square. This is a square. With QB and QC on opposite corners have equal charges of plus 1.5 coulomb. So these two charges, A, they are both positive and they carry the same charge. Okay. It charges QA and QD on the two, on the other two corners have equal charge and the problem equal charge means equal in everything, equal in magnitude, in value and side. So they are both positive or both negative. We will figure out. What is the charge QA so that the net force on QB is zero? Okay. What should be the charge of A that will make the net force on B equal to zero? Well, again, where is our focus? Our focus is B because we want to find the net force on B. So let's see. Analyze the problem and proceed. I will draw what is happening to B. We are already told, we are already told, here, here are the four charges. Let's first analyze the signs and directions. We are already told that B and C, okay, B and C are positive, okay? So these are positive. But we are told nothing about A and B. Uh, D, except that they are equal. But could they be positive or negative? Okay, well, the answers are all negative, but let's see why is it negative. Let me say that these are positive. What will happen in here? I am now drawing B. If this, if these all were positive, this is an assumption, a possibility. What will happen at B? Well, at B, here is B, this is B, this and this are positive, so there will be a repulsive force that way. Okay. This and this are also positive, so there will be a repulsive force upward. This and this are positive, so this will push that one away, and that will be the third force. As you can see, if you add up these three forces, they will never give you zero. The resultant will not be zero. So, these two cannot be positive. They must be negative. Okay? That's the second possibility. So, let me make them negative and then see what is going on here. Again, I will be focusing on the charge B. This is what he is asking about in the problem. So, we will first have the force between these two, opposite sign, so there will be an attractive force. And the force on this, due to that one, will be in that direction. This one and this one, both positive, so we have a repulsive force that way. This one and this one are opposite in sign, so we will have an attractive force downward. And therefore, this is the force acting on this one due to that one. Now the question says, what should be, what is the charge? What is the charge of A, right? What is the charge of A, that is this one. What is the charge of A that will make the net force on B equal to zero? Well, here is the force 
that comes from A. We want that to be zero. That means this force must be equal to the X component of this force. Okay, they are already opposite in sign. If the X component of this is equal to this one, then its force will be zero. Okay, so how could we do that? Well, equate the X component of this to this force. Let's do that. And let's now name the things. This is F on B due to C. This is F on B due to A. And this is F on B due to D. So for equilibrium, like we have seen from our analysis, M2, term 183. For equilibrium to happen, we must have FBC X equal to FBA. Okay? Now let's put the numbers. From Coulomb's law, this is K, QB, QC over, what is the distance between B and C? It is the diagonal of the rectangle. Okay? Here is the, sorry, the, the square. Let's say that the square has size of A. This is the diagonal R. We know from simple geometry that R squared is equal to A squared plus A squared, which is 2A squared. That's what we use here. So this is 2A squared. Is equal to the force between B and A, which will be QB, K, QB, QA, divided by the distance between A and A. B, which is just the side length of the square, which is A squared. It is this quantity that we are looking for, QA. So now, let's now cancel. The K will cancel. Uh, QB will cancel. A squared will cancel. And therefore, QA... Uh, sorry, we forgot something very important, the X component. Okay, what is the X component? This angle here is 45 degrees because this is a square the angle is either 90 or 45 so we multiply this by the x component which is root 2 over 2 okay cosine of 45 okay now qa is equal to root 2 over 2 root 2 over 4 indeed multiplied by qc okay and now we put the numbers this is root 2 over 4, do we know QC? QB, QC are equal to 1.5 Coulomb, so this is equal to 1.5, and if you put the numbers, you will get 0.53. Of course, it has to be a negative sign. That's the first analysis we started with, okay? A very, really demanding problem here uh, for people. The next problem is also a two-dimensional problem, like this one, but it is even worse because this is not a square, okay? This is arbitrary uh, problem. So let's look at the geometry. The problem says three pointed charges, Q1, Q2, Q3, are placed as shown in figure two. The magnitude of Q1 is five microcoulomb but its sign is not known. We know how much is Q1. It's 5 microcoulomb, but we don't know if it is positive or negative. The charge Q2 is not known at all, neither magnitude nor the uh, sign, while charge Q3 is plus 7 microcoulomb. So, fully known, half known, and known at all. Okay. The net force F on Q3 is in the negative x direction. It's not zero, but it happens to be in the negative x direction, means the net force on this one does not have a y component. It's in the negative x direction. Calculate the magnitudes of Q2. How much is this totally unknown for uh, charge? And the force F. How much is F 
calculate these two. So we have to find two things. How much is the unknown charge? And what is the net force acting on Q3? Let's work on the charge, okay? And to do that, let's look at the geometry given in the problem. So here is what we are given. Okay. Okay, Q3. Let's first figure out the signs. Q3, we are given what is Q3. Q3 is fully known. It's positive. This one is unknown. So, uh, <clears throat> Q2 and Q1. We want to fi figure out the signs of these two. So, let me draw the triangle, okay? Here is the triangle. This way. This is the a charge we are focusing on. We want a force on it. And this is positive. Okay, that's given. Let's now figure out these two. What should be the signs of these two charges? Let me take the possibilities. Let me say that this is positive and this is positive. What will be the force on that one? Well, positive and positive will go that way. Positive and negative will go that way. Okay? Here we have two forces. Will they add up to give me a resultant force like that one? No. So this is not possible. Let me now change the sign of one of them. Let me change this one. Make it negative. Okay? So that will be that way. And instead of this one, uh, what did we what did we do oh, sorry let me repeat the first one if they were positive and positive then repulsive and repulsive okay that's the situation if they are all positive again these will not add up to give me something that way so this is not possible let me put this one negative if this were negative then positive and negative will be an attractive force again these will not add up to give me a force that way so let me now make this positive and this one negative. What will happen in this case? Positive and, and positive will be that way. Positive and negative will be this way. Uh -huh. Now we have two forces which conceptually could add up to give me a net force in the negative x direction. So this is a possibility. Let me work out the last possibility. If they are both negative, okay? If they are both negative, then uh, what will happen? Positive and negative will be that way. This will be this way, okay? Now, this will add up to give me a downward force, which is not the situation. So, our conclusion is the only possible science for the charges is that Q1 is negative, and Q2 is positive. Let us double check. Positive and negative, attractive force. Positive and positive, repulsive force. And therefore, they may add up to give us that way. We figured out the signs. Now, what are these? This is F on 3 due to 2. And this is F on 3 due to 1. Okay. We figured out this. This is... A 90 degrees as given in the problem, 3, 4, 5, right angle, triangle. So the net force we are told is in this direction, given in the problem. What are the sides here? Well, you have the sides of the triangle. You can find that this angle here is 37 degrees. Okay, just take tangent inverse of 3 over 4. And therefore, this is 53 degrees. Now, this is equal to that. So, this is 37 degrees. And that is equal to 53 degrees. We did our homework. Now, let's start solving the problem. We want the net force to be in the x direction. That means the y component of this one must be equal to the y component of this one but they are already opposite in direction, so they will cancel. So let's equate, to do this problem, 
what we will do is equate the y, the values, the magnitudes of the y components. Q2, major 2, term 182. So what we want for equilibrium, uh, let me be careful, not equilibrium, for the net force to be in the x direction, what we need is F32y, that's the y component of this, must be equal to the y component of this in magnitude, F31y, in magnitude. They are opposite in direction. And now let's put the, the numbers. F32 is KQ3, Q2, divided by the distance between 3 and 2. What's that? 3 centimeters. So 9, 10 to the minus 4, the square. 9, 10 to the minus 4. And then the y component, sine of, where is 3, 2? 3, 2 is this one, so sine 53. Okay, sine 53. is equal to this thing, which is k q3 q1 over the distance between 1 and 3, 4 centimeters squared that, 16, 10 to the minus 4, and then sine of f31 is that one. The angle it makes is 37, so sine of 37. What are we looking for? One thing we are looking for is q2 which appears in here. Okay, so let's do cancellations. K, Q3, K, Q3. The 10 to the minus 4 will cancel. And I'm looking for Q2, right? Q2, what is that equal to? Q2 is equal to 9 over 16 times sine 37 over sine 53 multiplied by Q1. What is Q1? Q1, we are told what is Q1. It's 5 micro. If the answer is in micro, so I leave it as 5 times 5. And if I get the numbers, I will, if I put these numbers, I will get 2.11 micro -colon. That's half of the problem. That is just what is Q2. Now I have to find the force F. So you have to go there and re-substitute and find the force F. Or be smart. Look at the answers. Is there any other answer where Q2 is different, is the same as this one? No. That's the only answer that has the correct value of Q2. So I'll stop there. That must be the correct one, even if I don't find what is the force F. Already we did a lot of work to reach to this point. Next, we look at this problem involving electrostatic forces. So let's see what we have here. The problem says two small <clears throat> Two small identical metallic spheres of mass 0.2, kilogram, uh, 0.2 grams are suspended as pendulum by light strings as shown. So they, they are like a pendulum. The spheres are given the same electric charge Q. Okay, they have the same charge and therefore they repel each other. Uh, initially they are touching, okay, like this. And then you charge them by the same charge. The force of repulsion will cause them to separate as we have in here. They are given the same electric charge Q and it is found that they come to equilibrium when each string is at an angle of five degrees with the vertical. If each string is of length L 30 centimeters, find the magnitude of the charge on each sphere. Okay, well, uh, again, you analyze the forces. You take any one of them, they are exactly identical. So let me, look at this one here, draw its free body diagram, and see what do we have. I will draw the free body diagram of this one. So here is the ball. What forces are acting on it? 
we have the gravitational force, mg, and then we have the repulsive electrostatic force. They repel each other, and the force is along the line that connects the two. So here is the electrostatic force, Fe, and then we have the tension in the string. So here is the tension T. Okay. We are given this angle here with the vertical, which will be the same as this angle here, theta. What I'm looking for is the charge, and the charge appears here. So, find the equilibrium forces in the x and y directions and proceed. If we look at the x direction, which problem is this? This is question 3 in the second major exam of term 173. If I look at the x direction, I have the x component of the tension, okay, the x component of the tension, which, as you can see, is opposite to the angle, so it goes with sine. So I have T sine of theta is equal to the other force in this in the x direction, which is the electrostatic force. In the y direction, I have the y component of the tension, which, as you can see, is adjacent to the angle, so it goes with the cosine, and that is T cosine of theta is equal to the other force in the y direction, which is the gravitational force, mg. Now, divide these two equations. The t will cancel. Sine over cosine will be tangent of theta is equal to the electrostatic force divided by mg. So, the electrostatic force is equal to mg tangent of theta. What is the electrostatic force? Here comes Coulomb's law. Uh, they have the same electric charge. So Q1, Q2 will be Q squared. And therefore, this is K, Q squared, over R squared. R is the separation between the two, okay? Is equal to mg tangent of theta. Now let's find out how much is R. Draw the triangle. Yeah, here is the triangle. Uh, this is L. This is the angle theta. And I'm looking for this, which is R over 2. This is half the distance. This is R, the whole thing. So what can we say? Sine, sine of theta is equal to R over 2 over L. Okay? And therefore, R is equal to 2L sine of theta. I hope I'm doing things correctly. That's R over 2, L sine is R over 2 over R is equal to 2 L sine of theta. <clears throat> okay, so that's what we need here. And therefore, Q squared is equal to mg R squared mg tangent of theta <clears throat> times R squared, which is 4 L squared sine squared of theta huh? divided by K. Divided by, so divided by K. Okay? Mg times tangent theta, 4 L squared sine squared of theta there. And therefore, Q is equal to all of this under the square root. Let's now double check that we have the numbers. The mass of each is 0.2 grams. It changed that to kilograms. G is 9.8. Theta is 5 degrees. You need that here and here. The length L is 0.3 meters. K is 19 to the power 9. Put the numbers and make sure that the answer you will get is as we have it in here. The next problem we will consider is this one here, <clears throat> this is an equilibrium problem, I think. Let's go through it. It says two charges, Q1 equal to plus 6 microcoulomb and Q2 minus 12 microcoulomb are placed at minus 2, 0, and 4, 0. If a third unknown charge, Q3, is to be located such that the net force on it 
from charges Q1 and Q2 is zero, what must be the coordinates of Q3? We want to bring a third charge, whatever its value is, whatever its sign is, place it somewhere so that the net force on the third charge due to these two is equal to zero. Well, like we said, let's now review what we said. The third charge must be placed on the line connecting the two charges. Is it between them or outside? Look at the signs. The signs are different. Okay, one is positive, the other one is negative. So it cannot be between them. Otherwise, the two forces will be in the same direction. It has to be outside, either this way or this way. Closer to the weaker. Where is the weaker one? This is the weaker one. This is 6, this is 12. So it will be outside and closer to the weaker one. That means it will be some where in here. So this is the analysis and now we will build on it. Let's see, can we get the answers? Or exclude something. It cannot be at the origin. It cannot be on the positive x-axis. It cannot be there. Okay. Uh, minus 6.5, where is that? That's here, that's possible. Minus 14.5, that's here, possible. Minus 16.5 here, possible. So we have three possible answers. We were able only to exclude these two, but we have to work out to get the correct one. So from our analysis, we conclude that the point of equilibrium, where we place the third charge so that the net force on it is zero, must be as follows. This is question one, major two, term one, seven, one. Q3, the third charge, must be placed <clears throat> to the left of Q1, to the left of Q1, and let's say a distance x from the origin. A distance x from the origin. So this is where we will put it relative to the origin. Okay, so here is the situation. That's the origin. Here is Q2. This is Q1. And here is where we will place Q3. Okay? If Q3 were positive, then positive and positive, positive and positive will be repulsive. Positive and negative will be attractive. Okay, here we will have cancellation. If it were negative, you will have the same thing. So that's where it should be placed. The distance of the third charge from the origin, that's what we are calling x. How much is this distance? This distance is the coordinate of this, which is 2. And how much is this distance? That's the coordinate of that one, which is equal to 4. Now, what we want to have, to have the net force on this is 0, what we want is F3 due to 1, F3 due to 1, must be equal to F3 due to 2, okay? If these two forces are equal, they will cancel. They are already opposite. And here I'm only talking about the magnitude. We did our homework with regard to the signs when we did this analysis. So now I will just focus on the magnitude. This is K, Q3, Q1 over the distance between 3 and 1. 3 and 1. How much is that? This whole thing is X and this is 2. So this is X minus 2. X minus 2 squared. Is equal to the force between... 3 and 2, that is K, Q3, Q2, divided by the distance between 3 and 2 is all of that. Up to here it is X, and then I add 4. So it will be X plus 4 squared. Okay, cancel the K, cancel Q3. What I'm looking for is X. So... Uh, let's open up this square and multiply it by Q1. What is Q1? Q1 is equal to 6 and Q2 is 12. So this is x squared times 6, 6x six squared 
plus 4x times 2 is 8 8 times 6 48 x and then 16 16 times 6 is 96 is equal to square this and multiply it by q2 which is 12 so x squared 12 x squared and then i have minus 4x minus 4 times 12 is minus 48x and then 4 times 12 is 48 is equal to 0 okay note that when i substituted here i didn't substitute the signs because we already took care of that there let me make sure that i'm doing the correct thing here take everything to the side okay take everything to the side so i have zero here and then this will be six x squared okay minus 48 minus 48 is minus 96 x and then 48 minus 96 will be minus 48 that is equal to zero. 6 that will be x squared minus 16 x minus 3 is equal to 0 let's solve this I just want to make sure that we are on the right track uh, x is equal to 16 plus or minus 2 56 minus that means plus 4 times 3 12 under the square root divided by 2 okay let me have my calculator just to double check we have the correct answer this will be equal to 16 plus or minus 256 plus 12 and then the square root of this is 16.37 over 2. if i take the negative answer here the answer will be negative it cannot be negative because i'm talking about distance here so i have to take the positive answer so i will add plus 16 to this and then divide by 2 the answer is 16.2 which is close to that one just double check the calculations there and that's how we get the, uh, the correct position this is a full problem you really have no simplification here you cannot guess things you have to do it in detail to to see the thing so please just double check why is it 16.5 not 16.2 maybe we did a mistake along the way so just double, double check that <clears throat> next let us uh, look at this problem it seems like here we have a charge conservation and transfer so let's read the problem The problem says two small metallic spheres A and B carry plus one microcoulomb and minus one microcoulomb of charge, respectively held fixed at a certain distance without touching each other. How many electrons must be transferred? How many electrons, negative charge, must be transferred from one sphere to the other? To reduce the force of attraction between them by a factor of four so we want to transfer electrons from one of them to the other one to reduce the force whatever the force we have here we want to reduce it by a factor of four to to to, to have it divided by four we transfer electrons first to four from where to where electrons are negative so you are transferring negative charge where do you transfer the negative charge from from the negative sphere so it should be from b to a and therefore a is possible c is possible e is possible b and d are not possible you cannot transfer negative charge from a positive sphere okay it has to be from b to a now when we transfer the charge some of the transferred charge will cancel some part of this and therefore you have charge cancellation and therefore you have reduction of the force that's the idea here so now let's work it out in detail 
This is question two in the first major exam of 171. Question two, major two, term 171. Let's first find the initial force because that's what we will divide by four. What is the force to start with? Here are the spheres and this will be equal to K Q I squared. They carry the same magnitude of charge. Never mind the signs. We, we already dealt with the signs, but they are equal. One microcoulomb divided by R squared. The final force is equal to K Q F squared divided by R squared. Again, when you have uh, transfer the two charges would be equal on the two sides so you have that one and we are told that the final force is one fourth of this so it will be one fourth k q initial squared divided by r squared okay k will cancel we have the same separation and therefore the final charge on each sphere will be q initial over 2. Take the square root. Okay, that's what, what's what we have here. And this is 0.5 micro coulomb. Okay, so the situation is we took half a micro coulomb from this one. What is left? Half a micro coulomb. This half a micro coulomb will go there. What will it do? It will cancel half a micro coulomb from there. So we have minus half micro coulomb plus half micro coulomb. okay? They are now positive and negative, just like they are, they started with, but with the same uh, value of the magnitude of the charge. Now, if we want to have this much charge transferred from B to A, how many electrons are we transferring? Again, we go back to a charge quantization. This is a charge, so it can be written as some electrons, multiplied by the charge of the electron is equal to 0.5 microcoulomb is 5 times 10 to the minus 7. So the number of electrons that we have to transfer from B to A is equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 7 divided by the charge of the electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And if we put the numbers, you will get what we have here, something times 10 to the power 12 as we have it in here, and we agreed that it will be from uh, B to A. So this is really many ideas, charge quantization, conservation, as well as Coulomb's law. The next problem says the magnitude of the electrostatic force between two identical ions separated by that much distance is 3.7 10 to the minus 9. How many electrons are missing from each ion? Okay, well, the same story. You have the force, you have the separation. The force, the separation, find Q. Okay, identical. So it is the same Q. Take the square root, divide it by the charge of the electron, and you will have the answer as equal to 2. Very simple, straightforward problem. Next, we look at uh, some problems like the one we have here. It says, consider two identical conducting spheres, A and B. Identical means the same size, the same radius. Sphere A carries a charge of minus 12 microcoulomb. Sphere B carries a charge of plus 6 microcoulomb. The spheres are touched together and then separated. What is the final charge on sphere B? Well, when you touch them, the whole charge will add up algebraically and then it will be distributed equally on the two spheres because they are identical and then you separate them. What is the total charge? The algebraic sum of all charges. So we have minus 12 plus 6 that will be minus 6 and this minus 6 will now be divided equally so you have minus 3 microcoulomb on each one of them and that's what we have there. A conceptual problem we really didn't do any calculation there. So I consider this to be a conceptual one. Next, let's look at this one. It says consider two identical conducting 
spheres, again identical, conducting spheres, each of radius 10 centimeters. Initially, sphere 1 uh, has a charge of minus 60 microcoulomb, sphere 2 has a charge of plus 20 microcoulomb. They are touched and then separated by a distance of 2 meters, which is much greater than the radius of each. What's the magnitude of the electrostatic force between them after the separation? Well, you have to find the charges on them after the separation. Again, add the charges. We have minus 60 plus 20, then it is minus 40. This minus 40 will be divided equally, minus 20 minus 20. So here you have two spheres. Each one of them carries minus 20 microcoulomb. The separation is that much. What is the force? Straightforward. That would be 9, 10 to the power 9, okay, uh, minus 40 over 2 will be 20, so 20 squared, 400, times 10 to the minus 12 for the micro, divided by the distance between them, 2 meters squared, 4, okay, so the 4 will cancel the 4, and I have 9 times 10 to the minus 1, Okay, which is equal to 0.9. Okay, again, very simple, straightforward problem. The next problem looks like conceptual, and it says, a neutral metal ball is suspended by a vertical string. So you have a vertical string, and at the end of it, you have this neutral metal ball. When a positively charged insulating rod is placed near the ball, so here is the ceiling, there is the, uh, what is that, the string, here I have the metal ball. And then I bring a rod, okay, when a positively charged insulating rod is placed near the ball without touching, the ball is observed to, to be attracted to the rod. The ball is attracted to the rod. Why is that? A large number of electrons accumulate on the surface of the ball facing the rod. That's right, because since it is a metallic ball, it has free electrons. The free electrons, here they are, they see this rod coming and it is positive, so they will be attracted to it. And they will accumulate on the side of the ball close to the rod, and they will be attracted. Negative electrons, positive rod. So a large number of electrons accumulate on the surface of the ball facing the road. Let's look at this one. The electric charge on the ball becomes positive. No, the electric charge will not be positive. It will be like it was, neutral, zero. The electric charge on the ball becomes negative. No, the number of electrons in the ball is more than the number of electrons in the road. No, a large number of protons accumulate. This is definitely wrong because the protons are inside the nucleus they are attached to the nucleus and they are not free to move. So they have nothing to do with this charging process. A problem on this, this, the, the shield theory. Let's see what we have here. Question 1 in major 2 of 172 says, Figure 1 shows three situations involving a charged particle. Here it is, plus 6q, plus 2q, minus q involving a charged particle and a uniformly charged spherical shell, which are these circles here. These are the shells. The charges are given. The charges of the particles and the charges of the shells. And radii of the shells are indicated. So this has radius r over 2, r, and 2r. Rank the situations according to the magnitude of the force on the particle due to the presence of the shell, greatest, fairest. Well, let's see if there is any one of them zero. This one is zero, because it is inside the shell. So this is the least. This should be the last one, A. Uh, do we have one with A at the end? Well, we have E, and we have A. Both of them have A at the end. So at least we excluded B, C, and D. Now we have to figure out what is going on in these two. Let's look at B. In B, the force on the particle, it's outside the shell. So you consider the force as the force between 
two charged particles. It will be the force is K, the charge of the particle 2Q, and then the charge of the shell 4Q divided by the distance between them and the distance is D, so D squared. Let's clean this up. This will be 8K Q Q over D squared. What about C? C is this one. So the force in C is equal to K. The charge of the particle is Q. Never mind the sign. He is looking for the magnitude, Q. And then the charge of the shell, 8Q, divided by the distance between the center of the shell and the particle, again, that is D squared. So the force here is equal to 8K, small Q, capital Q, over D squared, which is the same as the force we put. So B and C tie, and then A. Okay, this is an application of the shell theorem. Next, we have this charge transfer, and that means we are dealing with conservation of charge. So let's look at this problem. The problem says, figure one shows three pairs of identical conducting spheres. One pair, two, three. Three pairs of identical conducting spheres that are to be touched and then separated. So you touch these two and then separate, touch these two and separate, touch and separate. The initial charges on them before the touch are indicated, as you can see in here. Rank the pairs according to the magnitude of the charge transferred during touching. Be careful. He is looking for the charge that is transferred during the touching greatest first. So here you have to uh, really make something like uh, a table and track what is going on. Okay. The final charge first. If we touch these first of all, what is the net initial charge here? Minus six, sorry, plus six minus four is plus two. Divide it into two, that would be plus E. Here, the total is plus two. Split it, that would be E. Here, the total is plus two. Split it, that is E. So the final charge in each situation, on each sphere, will be the same. There is no difference there. He's looking for, that's why I said, read the question carefully. He is not asking about the final charge. He is asking for the charge transferred during the touching. Now let's look at the transfer. To make the charge on this plus E, that means you took plus 5 and put them there. Okay, what about this one? You want the final charge to be plus E, that means you transfer 1E from here to here, and that's what you have. You just transfer 1E. For this one, you want the final charge to be plus E. You start with minus 12, and you end up with plus 1. How much did you transfer? 13E. Okay, and therefore, the ranking is, if we are looking for the greatest first, here is the greatest transfer. That's 3 and then one, and then two, three, one, two, as we have it in here. So here we have charge conservation. The next problem says, figure one shows three pointed charges, okay, three pointed charges, arranged in three different ways, as you can see in here, okay, arranged in, in three different ways. The charges are plus Q, minus Q, and minus Q, plus Q, minus Q, and minus Q. Rank the arrangements according to the magnitude, magnitude of the net electrostatic force that acts on the positive charge. So we have two negative and one positive. We want to find the magnitude of the net force acting on the positive one in each case. Okay? And here is what we have. Of course, smallest fairest. I think we agree that this is the smallest. This one would be attracted to that one, attracted to that one. The two forces are equal, opposite, so the net force here is zero. Uh, so we should have an answer that starts with 
B. Well, we have these two starting with B. We can exclude C, D, E, but now we have to figure out these. Let's look at the net force in situation A. The net force in A, acting with this one, will be F in A is equal to KQ squared, KQ squared over D squared, plus between this and that, K, Q squared over 4 D squared, 4 D squared. Well, this is 5 K, Q squared over D squared. Okay? That's the force in A. Let's look at the force in C. The force in C, let's say it, C1 which is the force between these two only, that will be kq squared, kq squared over d squared, and if c2, which is between this and this, is kq squared over 4 d squared. Therefore, the net force in C, they are perpendicular to each other. Parallelogram method says it is this squared plus this squared. Now, this number is common, take it out of the square root, and I have 1 plus 1 over 16 under the square root. Uh, the, sorry, this is 5, and I have 4, okay? This is uh, 5 over 4, 1.25 k q squared over d squared. What do I have here? k q squared over d squared, and let me get out how much is this. This will be 1 over 16. And then I add 1. And then I take the square root of this. That will be 1.03. 1.03 kq squared over d squared. So this is larger. Okay, this is larger. And if I'm going with smallest, the smallest is b then C, and then A. So it will be B, C, A, uh, where are we? A is a smaller? How could that happen? We're looking for that one. Let's double check. KQ squared over D squared plus KQ squared over 4 D squared. Okay. And if I add the numbers, I take 4 as a common factor. So this will be 4 plus 1 is 5 over 4. 5 over 4 is 1.25. Okay, let's now look at this one. These two are kq squared over d squared. Ah, this is d, not 2d. I was correct. This is d. Okay, so now if we add them, that will be 1 plus 1. Okay which will be square root of 2, square root of 2 is 1.41. So definitely this is larger than that one, and therefore the ranking will be BAC, BAC as we have it in here. The next problem says a charge Q is placed on the x-axis at x equal to A. Where should the charge Q2, which is minus 4Q1, it's opposite in sign and four times larger, be placed to produce a net zero electrostatic force on a third charge, Q3 is equal to Q1, located at the origin. So let's sketch and see what he is talking about here. This is question 7 in the final exam of term 182. Here is the x-axis. We have charge Q1 is placed at, let's say that this is the origin. Q1 is placed at x equal to A here. Okay, this distance is equal to A. Where should we put another charge minus 4 to produce a zero electric force on a charge located at the origin? Okay. This is a positive charge. We want to bring a second charge, negative, and four times this one, place it somewhere so the force on this one is zero. Well, let's look at the situations. 
Can we place it in here? Q2. Well, Q2 is negative. The point of equilibrium will be outside then, closer to the weaker. So that's possible. Okay, it should be to the right of Q1. To the right of Q1. Is that to the right of Q1? This is A, and he's saying put it at 2A. That's a possibility. At the origin? No. At x equal to minus 2a, no, minus a, minus 3a, all of these are here, which is the wrong position, so they are all incorrect, and the only possible answer will be a, okay? Next, along the same lines, we have this problem that says two-pointed charges, q1 equal to 4,000 protons, and Q2 equal to 6,000 electrons, positive, negative, and different values. Positive and negative. The point of equilibrium will be outside them, okay, since they are opposite charges, and it will be closer to the weaker. Where is the weaker one? Q1, because that's 4,000. This is the stronger, so the point of equilibrium will be this way. Let's read the problem. Uh, that much are arranged as shown in figure two. In which region could the third charge be placed so that the net vector static force on it is zero? As we agreed, that will be uh, region I here. The last problem we have here is this problem, which is uh, question eight from the final exam of term 183. It says figure one shows two charged particles fixed on the x-axis. Here are the particles, fixed on the x-axis. A third negatively charged particle can be placed at a certain point, one, two, three, or four on the x-axis, so that the net electrostatic force on it is zero. Which of the following answers can possibly be the correct position of the third particle? Well, since they have the same sign, both negative, the point of equilibrium must be between them. So it will be two or three. Closer to the weaker. Where is the weaker? Here's the weaker one. So the correct answer is point number three. With this, we come to the end of the problems we have on chapter 21. This is the only lecture we have on this chapter, which is about uh, review of electric, uh, basic electric concepts, uh, Coulomb's law, equilibrium problems, charge quantization, and charge conservation.